morning, everyone. As we get started, good morning for uh, 8:30 for Las Vegas time. I know it's a, <laughs> I know it's early for everyone, but uh, uh, I am uh, Scott McCarty. Work for Tampa General Hospital. I manage the Unified Communications team. I have a kind of a strange title, um, mostly because I'm somewhat new on the uh, on the Unified Communications side. So. Uh, I want to introduce Chris Maxey, who is the guy that actually does all the work. I am a, I'm the manager that kind of points at him and asks him to do stuff. But I am a, I'm getting up to speed. I've been there about a year and a half as far as a, I've been at Tampa General about three and a half years, but I've been uh, on the UC team about a um, year and a half. So, But uh, Chris is going to come up and um, speak to some of the technical aspects of this. Um, but I, I'm going to give you guys a general overview of the uh, business side of what we're, what we're doing and some of the neat things we're doing. Um, as far as technical level, we're, uh, we're in the middle of a lot of things. So we've, got a lot, we've done a lot of neat stuff. We've modernized a lot of things, but we've got a lot more to do. So we're kind of in the middle of things. So um, I would ask that you, uh, you keep most of the questions till the end because um, we've got a lot to cover. But... Uh, um, you know, it's it's a small enough group. If you if you have anything that's really pertinent, you can you can ask in the middle. But um, otherwise, if we want to get into anything uh, deeper, we we'll be available after this. We'll have a Q and A session for 15 minutes, and then we'll be available uh, for a half hour after this session as well. So so I'm going to explain um, a little bit about the hospital. Then I'll go into kind of a brief history of what we've done, and I'll um, and then we'll get into some of the uh, technical aspects of of our link architecture, which Chris will get up here and help me explain for a few minutes. And then we'll talk about mobility and um, some, of the, uh, some of the things we have up ahead of us for, as far as enterprise voice and some other aspects of things. Um, so Tampa General Hospital is, is where we are in, uh, as it sounds, right in the middle of uh, Tampa, just south of downtown. Um, we're actually located on an island called, it's a, a group of islands called Davis Islands. Um, it's, uh, 1,018 beds, over 7,000 employees. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, physicians that are not employed by us, so we have um, we have a, a, a big mix of, of people we support. So that's that introduces some challenges that I'll get into in a little while. Uh, we're the primary teaching hospital for University of South Florida. It's the uh, uh, Morsani College of Medicine. Um, so that's actually where most of our physicians are employed is by USF. Um, we're not for profit, so we have to operate under um, some strict guidelines. We can uh, not for profit is different from nonprofit. It means we can make money, but we have to put that money back into the hospital. Um, so it's uh, a lot of hospitals are operate under those guidelines. So it's it's not a really unique, but it's uh, but it definitely caps what we can do as opposed to a, a for profit system. So. As far as our history, um, it's kind of a play on Stephen Hawking's brief history of time. Uh, and what I call the IT Stone Ages was only three years ago. And I'm sure you guys can all relate. It's uh, three years ago, we were literally dependent on a mainframe, Lotus Notes. We actually have, still have Lotus Notes in some capacity. Same time for instant messaging, um, WebEx and BlackBerry. We are phasing out our Blackberries. I think we'll be done this week or next week with our uh, last Blackberries. So we're <laughs> we had uh, almost 700 of them less than a year ago. So it's been a, it's been a big effort to get off of those. Um, the IT department was very small too. And we only had one data center. Um, HIMSS is um, kind of a, it's a uh, organization for, if you guys aren't familiar, for um, Healthcare information management. So, it's they uh, rate from stage one to uh, seven. Seven being the absolute highest, being most wired, being um, having your um, electronic medical record fully integrated into your processes. We're at stage two, so very low, no integration really, or not much. Um, so, very old stuff. Uh, very small team supported all that. Uh, so, about the time I was brought on board. Uh, a little over three years ago, we um, we started implementing Epic, and Epic more than doubled the size of the department. 
it's a, it was a giant effort. It was a $130 million project, biggest thing a hospital ever did. Um, that brought us up to him stage six, just overnight with all this integration we did. So at the same time, though, we phased out Lotus Notes and brought in, uh, migrated to BPAWS uh, dedicated. So email uh, Exchange 2010 in the cloud and a dedicated environment. Uh, we're, we're still on that, actually, to this day, but almost, almost migrated to Office 365. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> brought in a lot of Tanberg units for video conferencing uh, because, because of this, the size of the implementation. We had, to, we had to spread out and have multiple command centers, things like that. So we still have a big Tanberg base. Um, and we gave out iPhones, iPads, um, specifically iOS because it was easy to use, easy to roll out, but um, it was the only real tablet at the time. We've since moved to uh, Surface in some capacity, but um, so we have, a, we have a large base of iOS, though. Um, OCS was brought in to replace same time, um, did live meeting for a little while, um, but then recent history, so we went from Stone Ages to recent history in just a year, a little over a year. Um, brought in Link on-premise, uh, which we do presence, video, audio, conferencing. Uh, got rid of WebEx, so you can see we've done a, we've done a lot right there. Uh, full automation, um, which I will get to later too, and that's uh, something Chris Maxey is an expert in. Um, he, is, he is my uh, savior with PowerShell and um, Expert's not strong. It's <laughs> um, we've done other things like enterprise data warehouse. We've got the more information we give the customers, the more they want. The more tools we give them, the more they're clamoring for, and they expect so much out of us. So it's great stuff, but it's also scary at the same time. And then um, recently we achieved him stage seven. We, so we're at the very top. We're uh, one of uh, we're in the top two point two percent of hospitals now, as far as being um, well connected and. Uh, for patient safety and um, automation. So it's, it, it's awesome, we love it. Um, but again, with all that stuff, they still want more. So I, I wanna explain our team structure. We have a lot of stuff we support um, right now. Unified Communications doesn't support every bit of this, uh, but some a alone, but some aspects of all of this. So. Our um, user base is 7,100 licensed uh, users for Link and Office 365. Got about uh, 12, 15,000 AD users, depending on how you look at it. Um, 350 applications, 1,400 servers, 75% of that's virtualized now through VMware. Um, 7,000 workstations, laptops, 1,000 tablets, uh, over 10,000 phones. Um, and our team, our team is my team uh, with Chris Maxey, and it was two other guys till Monday. We actually got a we got a new guy on our team finally. Um, so we have uh, me, um, manager, and then four guys now support um, most of this stuff. So Link, Link Office 365. So Link email. Um, AMCOM, which is our physician on call schedule, and it is going to be a, uh, a mobile platform. There's a, uh, an app called AMCOM Mobile Connect that we're gonna be rolling out in a few months to all the physicians for secure texting. Um, it's a pager replacement. It's got some deep integration into our uh, call center. There's some overlap with Link that we need, to, uh, we need to figure out there, but for right now, this is how we're moving ahead. Um, AD Automation really is a security team function, or it should be, but again, Chris is so good at it, and our, uh, a big part of the automation is getting our link and email accounts provision that um, we, ND provision, very good point. There's a lot of turnover. Um, very important, there's no way these guys could have survived with three of them for the past few years supporting three major, major enterprise systems, so they've done an awesome job with automation, and I'll, uh, I'll cover some of that here in a little bit. Um, Mobile computing is a tough one right now. We're trying to uh, we're trying to divide and conquer that. Unified Communications used to own mobile computing, and 
that meant they did BlackBerry training, but they didn't manage all the Blackberries. Our telecom group did that, so we had some overlap there. We started replacing Blackberries with iOS devices, with iPhones. So, you know, up front we said, hey, if we're going to take on 700 more devices, we can't, we can't do that. We need to, we, can, we support iOS now, but we need to transition the day-to-day -day stuff over to other teams. So, um, with all these things and all these different teams, uh, BMDI is biomedical device integration. They handle our uh, middleware with our uh, Philips devices and a lot of the medical equipment. So a lot of things have to connect. Um, but this right now doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us because it's, uh, it, it's very siloed. And it's starting to show, uh, especially with unifying all these communications. And that's, and that, that's kind of the theme of this whole conference. Yes? Sorry, can the color do something? Um, the, the way I color coded, I'll show you on the next slide. The um, unified communications in red is because it's, it, because it's us. Um, let me flip ahead to the next slide here, and I can show you how they merge. Um, so I've got an asterisk there because we haven't done this, but it's a natural evolution, and we are most likely going to do it. Um, we've kind of been waiting on this for a while, but to really support these things right, all these service lines, we're going to need to bring telecom under UC. So this is proposed. This is the way we want to do it. Um, audio video is another, another um, thing we haven't quite tackled yet. We've basically got one AV guy. Um, so to bring the one AV guy over wouldn't be, a, wouldn't be a huge undertaking to do. But with things like Link Room System and some of the um, integration between Link and Tanberg, like we're trying to do now, um, we really need to work closely with those guys. And it's, uh, these, these lines are going to keep getting more and more blurred. So this, this makes the most sense to us. And what I'm showing there is more collaboration with the other teams. So we're going to have to have some committees. Um, we, we can't just merge those other teams. So they still have day-to-day -day things, but they're going to have to work closely with each other. We can't do this all alone. Yeah, our, um, our structure is uh, we, have a, we have a CIO and then we have a CTO. Um, this all falls under the CTO. That's the dividing line. We basically have our um, CTO, so our technology office, and then we have our application side of things. And um, this is all under the technology side. Um, <clears throat> some of this is actually under, actually most of this is under um, computer operations, which is under one director that we report to. But some of it isn't, like BMDI is under a different director, so is security. So that's why we can't just merge those other things. But, but for UC, we think this makes the most sense going forward. So <clears throat> it's great, but we've got a lot, a lot more to take on now. So. But I think we're going in the right, I think we're going in the right direction. So I'm going to explain UC, uh, I'm sorry, Link, um, and our basic history. And then I'm going to have Chris explain the actual architecture of um, how, how the server backend fits together. Um, and Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, because again, Chris built, he built all this. And I am slowly getting up to speed, but, um, but he's done a great job educating me on all this. So. Um, so we had, as I said earlier, we had OCS live meeting, had some other things in the past, but um, really implemented Link 2010 and rolled it out to everybody in uh, 2012, so somewhat recently. Um, decided to do it on-premise, though, because of some of the voice and video integration we wanted to do. And we like the, uh, we like the control. Um, as I said earlier, we do email in the cloud, so we're perfectly fine with, with cloud technologies, but with Link and some of the possibilities with voice and video we want to keep that on on premise and we've got some good um, we've got some good server architecture we've got some good um, firewall equipment and things like that I think we've got some good control over things and and a very good knowledge base so um, nothing we need to outsource right now so um, we're still on the link 2010 desktop client and um, link 2010 mobile was never officially rolled out it's there if anybody wants to use it they can use it um, the, uh, we did roll out self-service conference bridge scheduling, link online meeting. We rolled that out to our, um, to our PMO first, our project management office. We thought they were a good, uh, 
test space, and then we rolled it out to the rest of IT and all our admin assistants and uh, executive admins. So not, not house-wide yet, but so far it's been great. People hate calling to reserve a conference bridge. Now they can just click a button. They love it. Um, we, we actually integrated our Tanberg uh, conference rooms, which we had back when we did it last year, we had about um, 30 of them. And there were some, um, there were some challenges, and I'll, I'll get into those in a little bit, because um, that's something we do want to revisit. So we never really rolled that out. We got it working. Wasn't very trainable for the end user community. So, and, and we knew Link 2013 was going to break that functionality, so we held off on that and uh, didn't, didn't roll it out. Well, Late last year. Uh, well, not Go to ahead. mention the fact that uh, you heard rumors way back a year ago saying that uh, there was going to be direct integration with Link and Hamburg. Uh, and it was just confirmed at the keynote today, so uh, it was actually a, it's a pretty good decision on our part to hold off until that integration is complete. Yep. So. so the fact that we didn't roll it out was. Was good. Yeah, so those we you know we, we well because you know if we would have rolled it out they would have been had to train to you know join a meeting in a certain way and then once we you know redid the architecture so that it is directly integrated then they would have to relearn that process again so we we don't like having to train our users twice to do the same thing so we'll, we would rather wait. Yeah, we've got some processes that have been in place in that hospital for 20, 30 years. So it's 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 a slow moving ship as we. As we say, now we're doing a lot of stuff, but um, you know, if it works well, they'll adopt it quickly and make that their new process. But we've got to do things solid from the start. So, um, so we made some decisions here to hold off on a few things, but I think that I think that was good. Um, we did upgrade Link, the server backend, um, everything except the reverse proxy, which we've got uh, we've got a little more work to do, and uh, we'll explain we'll explain some of the things we ran into there in a minute. Um, so we are on Link 2013 on the back end. Link 2013 mobile is available if anybody knows to download it. We advise people to do it if they want to use the mobile app, but we haven't officially announced it. So it's there. It's easy enough to set up, but until we get um, until we get some more key pieces done, we don't want to officially support it. I also like to note on that. So your users, are, some of your users are pretty smart. They will find out that that is available uh, even though you don't tell them because we've been monitoring you. Oh, oh, all of a sudden, a, a Link 2013 mobile client just showed up on our uh, registrar server. You know, and, uh, and then they tell everybody else, and you know, growth probably starts to grow. That's there's a, definitely a word of mouth thing. Yeah. Well, Chris, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna step aside and put up the uh, architecture oh, and, have you, slide. and have you uh, right. have you explain that, and then uh, some of the challenges throughout. All right. Okay. So um, our link infrastructure consists uh, mainly of three front-end servers and two edge servers. The uh, three front-end servers are in a single site, single pool, um, and they have all the uh, server roles co-located all in each of the front-end boxes. Uh, we opted to do physical hardware for our front-end servers as well as our edge servers, and I'll get into that in a little bit, why we made that decision. Um, for, DNA, for load balancing the traffic for our front-end pool, um, we opted to do DNS load balancing rather than hardware load balancing um, because at the time we were looking at you know load balancing options, you know hardware load balancing your front end pool traffic didn't seem to be there didn't really seem to be any need to do that unless you were needing to provide support for old OCS uh, clients. Uh, since since we're all linked 2010, that wasn't really much of an issue. And the same thing goes for um, the edge uh, the edge pool as well. Um, the edge pool is a little bit more different. You know, you, you have the same you know the same requirements. You know, if you need to provide support for old OCS, but also um, if you need to provide uh, failover capabilities for um, if you do PIC at all, um, you know, you would need to use a hardware load balancer. You know, as an organization, we decided that that wasn't really uh, a top priority, so that we we just we just noted that as a risk. Um, now, as far as why we went physical over virtual, um, that was because at the time we were doing the, our initial installation, it was actually easier and faster to get hardware than it was to get VMs. And I know, I know for those of you familiar with VM provisioning, that sounds very odd. 
right? Considering the procurement process in most organizations is very long. But uh, in our situation, um, we decided we wanted to deploy Link and, you know, as far as Microsoft best practices is concerned, right? So we looked up documentation regarding, you know, how you should implement Link in a virtualized environment. And it listed out uh, quite a bit of requirements that state that, you know, you need to configure your VM hosts this way, you need to configure your VMs this way. And um, when we brought that to our, um, our VM team, you know, they needed a long lead time in order to, number one, make those changes and test them out before they would give us the okay to modify the VM uh, infrastructure. So rather than go through that, we had a very short time period to get uh, our initial link installed. It was only like a month, you know, so uh, not to mention the fact we already had some hardware on site already that we could have used, so we just went ahead and went with physical hardware. Uh, that was one. That was one uh, point. The other one was is that uh, we wanted um, we didn't want to. What's the word? Um, you know, if there was an issue that came up with Link, we didn't want we didn't want to worry that our VM infrastructure was causing an issue. So we wanted to simplify our our deployment and just do physical. Um, the only um, other design component that's of note is we decided to use certificates, uh, third-party certificates everywhere, rather than just the uh, edge. Um, and, and the reason for that is because uh, at TGH, we have a lot of uh, BYOD. Uh, we have people bringing in their own laptops from wherever, and uh, they request the ability to sign into Link. Now, we could have, we could have, provided them the uh, internal root TA for them to install on their computer, but we didn't want to complicate the uh, process further by you know, having them to go through an extra step. So, you know, a third party share costs, you know, about a couple hundred dollars, you know, a year or three years. So we thought that that would be the best way to provide the most seamless uh, user experience. Um, our SQL backend is, it's running two uh, SQL 2008 R2 boxes. Uh, they're set up in a mirror, and we have uh, we have a SQL Express instance that's functioning as our um, that functions as our failover. Uh, you know, if for, one, for whatever reason one SQL box is fa uh, fails, it'll that witness will help fail over that uh, over the other one. Uh, as Scott mentioned, our reverse proxy is still running ISA 2006. I know it's very very old. <laughs> it's a very sore point to me. Um, it's one of those things I haven't got around to uh, replacing yet. Uh, we're looking at several different reverse proxy solutions to replace it. You know, uh, we're looking at the IS with application request routing. Um, we d we're looking at TMG for a little bit until they decided to deprecate that. And then, um, and then our other option is to do Windows application uh, proxy that's available in Windows 2012 R2. Um, and there's one other thing I'd like to make note. Uh, on this slide, uh, you'll note that there's a Palo Alto and a Cisco ASA <coughs> that provides that uh, <coughs> provides our DMZ. Um, this is actually showing what our architecture looks like now. This is the 2013. When we were in 2010, um, we uh, we actually only had a single hot DMZ, uh, and uh, that's if you try and deploy your Link Edge in a single hot DMZ, it's it's very problematic, especially uh, if you don't want to have a leg, um, uh, if, if, especially if you have to try to have the uh, internal and external legs in the same, on the same network. It, uh, it creates problems. Uh, we, we tried doing that and we kind of got it to work, um, but uh, it, wasn't, it, wasn't very, it wasn't very successful. So when we, uh, when we were redoing our infrastructure for 2013, we, uh, we were able to convince the network team to drop in another uh, firewall for us, so that way we can have a true double hop DMZ. Um, because, uh, you know, when we had it, when we had it all on one uh, network, both the internal and external mix <coughs> for your edge, it was, uh, it created, I mean, it worked 90, you know, it worked 98% of the time, and then that every 2%, it would throw some, you know, you'd get some weird IM message that you could not troubleshoot whatsoever, because, you know, 
you know, your architecture wasn't to what Microsoft said it should be. So. And that two, that two percent would happen to our CIO usually, yeah, and, exactly. and nobody else. So, <laughs> right. luck of our draw. Um, that's it. All I had on the architecture. Flip to the next uh, slide where we got the challenges. There's, uh, I think we covered we covered most of it. Oh yeah, technical. Okay. Oh, uh, one other one other technical issue that we came across was direct access. Yep. Um, we implemented direct access recently, and uh, uh, and that actually broke our link implementation for a little bit. Uh, whenever you deploy link uh, direct access, um, if you're not running IPv6 for your link architecture, you have to uh, disable. Uh, you have to prevent uh, direct access from servicing a request for anything bound to your link infrastructure. Uh, and direct, access direct access is a, uh, it's an alternative to VPN technology. So it's like an always on VPN. So like no matter where you are, uh, your, direct, your computer is connected back to the corporate network. Right? Yeah, anything going to your corporate network, it knows to route. To back to your corporate network, it works similar to the way like a Cisco ASA would it would work. It would send inter, what they call interesting traffic back to your corporate network. If I'm just surfing the web, if I'm going to CNN.com or something, that goes straight out to the internet. But they never have to worry about um, connecting to a VPN first. So much easier for the users, but adds some complexity adds on the some, back end. It adds quite a bit. Yeah, not quite a bit, but it adds some complexity on the back end. But basically, the way, the, round, the way to get around that is you configure your direct access to say that, you know, this traffic bound for this link resource is not interested. You know, we're not interested in that traffic. So don't resolve and send it to, you know, send it via its normal pathways. But the, the reason this is listed under involvement is because that's, that's another team that managed that. So right. they were doing that off on their own. We were doing this and found out, oh, boy. These th these two things are not working now, so we need to scramble to come well, up. Well, it was it was kind of interesting because like I told I was like I was a pretty I was aware that that project was going on, and then I said before you turn that on, I was like please get back with me because you'll break link, and then um, it, t it got turned on anyway, and and then it broke link, so. <laughs> Yes, and uh, I w we would have included it on the slide, but it's actually pretty full, so <laughs> uh, we ran out of real estate. Yeah, so. and we'll, we'll, we'll get to voice here in a little bit and explain some of the stuff we're, uh, we're starting to do more with it, so that's part of what so, we'll cover. Right, so um, we, do have, we do have voice capabilities within the link. Um, right now, our, you know, if we could draw it, there would be an Avaya PBX somewhere in the corner, you know, um, and... Uh, we have a direct SIP trunk between the Avaya PBX and our link, uh, link server. So. Covered, I, oh, well, I covered actually all those. So, and I think it's back on to you, right? All right. Thank you, Chris. All right. So, um, I'll explain some of our some of our challenges, um, and this is stuff that's going on in, with hospitals in general and healthcare. Um, and it's, you know, the title of this is rapidly uh, adopting to a rapidly changing environment and then in healthcare. And that's, and this, this is slide one. I've got another slide of, of this sort of stuff, and I'll, I'll, you don't need to know all the details about it if you're not in healthcare, but uh, there are a number of things that, that drive what we're doing right now. Um, and that's why we're, we're scrambling to get all this stuff um, to change and to integrate quickly. Uh, meaningful use is, is one that um, not a lot of people understand, and it's a, it's a very, it was a very vague term to me. I didn't care as a, as a network guy, but um, everything we do, we have to document why we're doing it and how much we're using our electronic medical records. So uh, that directly impacts our bottom line and how much money we get back from the government as a not-for-profit organization. So that's a, that's a huge one. Uh, we had something come up a couple months ago, and um, they said, we need this, uh, we need this uh, thing working with your email system. 
uh, by the end of next week. And we said, well, we, we're doing something else. We don't have time for that. They said, well, we'll lose $4.2 million if you don't do this next week. So it's that type of stuff we're running into that keeps, that keeps hitting us. So a lot of government mandates coming down very quickly. Um, that's, also, um, that's also forced hospitals to have to merge. Um, so that's always hanging over our heads. Uh, are we going to be bought up by somebody big like HCA that owns, you know, hundreds of hospitals? Or are we going to be, uh, are we going to form a partnership? We've, we've done that. We just formed a, uh, some sort of limited partnership with Florida Hospital um, to start opening some, some um, what they call big boxes, some, uh, some clinics where we're um, keeping things out of the hospital, but we can still do um, some... Um, some of the more invasive uh, outpatient procedures. So there, there are things like that that are going on. Um, Value-based purchasing is big. That's, uh, that impacts how you buy things. Like if, if we go to buy um, 100 cases of syringes, it um, costs us X amount of dollars. But if we partner up with Florida Hospital to buy this, we form a buying union, we can buy in bulk and save a lot of money. So, um, but because of that, we always have to plan ahead and think, is our communication strategy going to bite us? Do we need to make this open? Do we need to leave room for growth or integration later with another organization? So that's always hanging over our heads. Um, Medicaid cuts, is, it goes back to um, government, and government reimbursement. And um, we, we are what's called a safety net hospital. So we do a lot of uh, a certain percentage of our funding um, of our care is charity work. So. Uh, we get Medicaid reimbursement for some of that, but uh, they keep doing big cuts across the board. And uh, two years ago, it was like anywhere from 20 to 70 million. They said we're losing, and we're 1.2 billion dollar budget. So that's a pretty big chunk to get hit with. So IT a lot of times gets gets hit first with some of that because we don't directly take care of patients, although we're starting to. So we need to we need to keep pushing that and educating why this technology is important. Um, ICD-10 is just a coding system. It just specifies um, how they, um, they, there's a code for every procedure you get. If you have a, uh, if you have a broken arm and you need, uh, you need that fixed, there's a certain uh, number of code that gets assigned with that. But ICD-9 has been around forever. ICD-10 basically says um, there's a special code depending on how they fix the arm and which arm it is. And it's more specific, but um, because they're doing that, they have to do a lot of real-time testing, which, you know, again, that's, that's a medical system. That's a, something we shouldn't have to deal with directly, but we're getting hit because they say we have to send secure patient information back and forth with all these vendors to make sure our systems can communicate these new codes. Um, so that hits us on the communication side. Um, HIPAA is something... You guys probably heard of, uh, you know, if you're a patient or you go to a pharmacy, you have to sign HIPAA consent forms now. Um, it's a very loose list of guidelines. Uh, so when we talk about HIPAA concerns, we, we have to make sure things are, things are secure and confidential, and, uh, but it's, a lot of it's open-ended. It doesn't, it doesn't spell out specifically how you have to do things sometimes. So, um, it does tell us, though, we have to make sure things are secure end-to-end -end through TLS or other means, SSL, whatever the system may be. So it's always there. It's always something we have to be aware of, and we have to know about how the medical systems work to, to um, implement communication systems. So that does hit us. Um, physicians, and we'll talk about some of this, uh, you know, it, it, it all comes down to getting hold of physicians, getting them in touch with the patients at the right time and the right people. Um, they're hard to get hold of. There are less of them uh, for the amount of patients coming in. So uh, they're looking to us to, for technology to help with that. So that's, that's hitting us. Um, patient experience is what a lot of this is coming down to. Uh, the government's really ratcheting up the way you get reimbursed. And that all comes down to what they call HCAP scores. And that stands for Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems. What that is is like a Scantron sheet you get mailed to you after you're a patient at the hospital. And basically, if we don't get like all nines, um, we fail. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's one of those surveys that can't be just we did sort of well. We have to get a certain percentage of almost perfect ones 
Um, and then if we hit a certain percentage, we get certain reimbursement, and that varies tens of millions of dollars a year. So, um, so to drive that up, there are a number of ways you can do that. And one of these important ones uh, from our standpoint is um, what's called the hospital or a quiet hospital initiative. So that means, you know, if, if I'm in bed, I'm, I'm an inpatient, um, I'm staying overnight in a hospital bed, I don't want to be woken up by, um, by audible alerts on phones and overhead pages and things like that. So there's a big push to make things quieter. So things like um, getting away from phones and or making things um, translate over to different means of communications, like having uh, voice to text, things like that can be, can be huge in this. Um, Self-service, we've got patients that want to be able to do things like bring in their own tablets, connect to things, contact physicians that way. Starting to do, we're starting to get pushed in that direction. We know that's coming. Um, and then expansion into the community is the last one that's really hitting us. Um, as I said, we are, on a, we are actually on an island, and uh, that's, that's a picture of the hospital. Um, we have no room to grow. We're a two million square foot campus. Um, there's nowhere else to go other than out into the community. But we need to move out into the community anyway because it's expensive to treat people here. In any hospital, it's expensive to treat people. So we're trying to put care closer to the patients out in the community. Um, so that's why we're opening all these new clinics. But opening new clinics, opening new um, and integrating existing doctor's offices with our EMR systems means that we have to extend our communications out further and in some cases to people that aren't employed by us or licensed by us for our, for our systems like links. So that's a, you know, that's a challenge for us. So I'm going to talk about how mobility is hitting us and what we're doing with it. So I just mentioned we are expanding. So this is a map of uh, Tampa. And yes, it's taken from my Windows phone, Microsoft people. Um, this, is a, uh, this shows some of our, uh, some of our clinic locations. And, uh, so we're, ha we're happy to see that they are showing up on, uh, on Bing Maps now. Um, so uh, that's one thing, expansion. In what I'm calling modernization of the workforce, we've got things like people working from home. Um, Link has been a big hit with this, especially with IT, but, but lots of other departments are starting to do this. We have uh, what's called AWS, alternate work schedule. So for us, we can work one day, at, one day a week at home. Um, as sitting in the manager meetings, I, I see how uh, there, there's a certain trust level that has to be built up with certain employees. So presence has been huge in that. Um, and it, it, not so much trust. So, you know, I said, you can rely on that to a degree. I said, you know, so I, I got in front of it because I knew when I heard the talks, I said, I have a feeling they're going to rely on Link. So sure enough, they, they, they do, some of them. But I said, you know, Presence can be tampered with a little bit, but they do heavily rely on it. And we've actually written into the policy that you need to have Link running on your desktop. Um, you need to have a home office, that sort of thing. Well, so yeah, you need to be signed in. You need to be signed in. Right. Um, yeah, so that's, so that's enabled us not only to be able to communicate in real time from home, but also for the managers to know that their people are you know, available and, and actually working. Um, it's all, there have also been some challenges with this. Um, so we have things like shared workstations, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit too. That is a big one for us. Uh, we have nurses that mainly use auto-login PCs. They use very generic um, Windows images where they can't really do much until they launch a Citrix session or log into a web browser. Uh, Link runs on those desktops, but unless they specifically log into Link, um, they don't use it. So for the most part, it goes unused. So we want to we change that. Um, one way to do it is to do something like VDI and have it automatically pop up. Talked about using a web version of Link once we do Office 365 portal. Uh, but then we're also starting to do a uh, BYOD initiative. And that's, that's the uh, last big thing that we're dealing with right now. We're just starting to uh, do officially. As Chris mentioned, we've kind of unofficially supported it where if people knew they could download the Link app and sign in and it worked, fine, but we didn't officially announce it or support it, we're going to be doing that now. Uh, we're actually rolling out AirWatch as our uh, MDM this I, month. I actually have a question for the room. Uh, how many of you uh, 
how many of you have deployed Link already? Okay. All right. Also, how many of you have? What are you guys using as your as your authentication method for? You know, are you using Sam account name or are you using UTN field to authenticate users? Sam account name. I would highly, highly recommend that you switch over, if possible, to the UTN. Um, and if and it would be even better for you if you match your UTN to your email address and SIP address. If your SIP address, email address, and UTN all match, the sign-on process and the experience for the user is so much more nice. Um, it's uh, it uh, we we actually we we were actually in the same boat. We actually had. Uh, we were actually using Sam account name for logging into Link and to Outlook. Um, when we switched over to doing the UTN and the UTN matched all across the board, it uh, it greatly simplifies logging into those applications. So yeah, do I? It's just something to something to think about. Um, you know, uh, when and we're we're already about to roll that out in a, in a few months. So. Yeah, we've got IT guys that support Active Directory that are asking, do I put TGH backslash in front of this? Do I, where's the backslash on my iPhone? It's three levels deep, you know, it's, we don't have to worry about that now, so. Right, um, it, it, plus, you know, it, you know, everybody knows what an email address is, so that's what I say, like, you know, oh, all you have to do now is use your email address and your regular password to sign in, and that becomes so much more easier than telling them, all right, you gotta. You have to be domain backslash. All right, which one's the backslash key again? And then, uh, and then, uh, so it's just, just overall easier, yep. especially for the, especially for the uh, help desk. Yep. Anyway. Good, good point. So, yes, we still have three over three thousand pagers still in service. So, so there's actually, another. Actually, uh, I, I do want to revise that number. It's no longer 3,000. It's 2,200. We think. Congratulations, yes, we got rid we of We think, we are, uh, so I, as I mentioned, we're doing things like um, Amcom, Mobile Connect, we're doing uh, Link, we're doing a number of things that can replace these. But uh, I mean, this, this is the same pager I'm sure a lot of you have had back even in the I had one in the 90s. Yeah, so um, I, just, I just, I, I never thought I'd be, because I, I, I work, you know, in IT, so like when I got thrown into communications, I didn't think I would ever have to work with this, but, you know, uh, healthcare is probably one of the few organizations that still heavily rely on pagers. That um, was the biggest shock to me when I came over to this team, too. I said, you yeah. gotta be kidding me. I took this job to do this. Yeah, and the, uh, and, uh, this model of pager has been in, you know, in production forever. Uh, they don't make, they don't make new pagers. They, they refurbish old pagers, um, and that's just. Well, they bounce off walls the best. Yes, they do. I think. So, uh, you know, here, here's, here's a challenge for us, right? Um, easy enough to say, let's get rid of pagers. Let's do a smartphone app. Um, this is kind of our, uh, we, we created something called device matrix. We have like a pre-approved device list um, that specifies if you're, if you're this level of leadership, you automatically get this model of iPhone, uh, you get a tablet, you get this type of PC. We've got, uh, what, I, what I mentioned here is that this is by number of users. So um, we've got more devices than this. This is just how many people have devices. So in each of these groups. So there is no one size fits all. Um, that's, you know, we, we've tried that. Uh, there's, there's not a great way. Um, politics aside, you're still gonna have issues with um, life cycles of everything. So uh, I'm gonna show one of the, um, I'll come back to it in a minute. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna talk about what we're doing with Enterprise Voice. And then I want to come back to one of our one of our new things we're we're testing that's that's so far worked really well and been pretty well adopted. Um, with Enterprise Voice, one of the uh, you know UC's UC's kind of new in the last few years at, at TGH. Um, there are a few things hitting us that I already mentioned with um, initiatives to save money. Uh, we have race this thing called Racer. It's basically a revenue cost reduction. Um, or it's a uh, cost expenditure reduction um, committee. It's our CEO uh, a couple of years ago said we need to we need to figure out a way to save money and quickly. So he basically divided uh, leadership up into a few teams and put them against each other to save money. 
Um, one, of the, one of the big ones that, that we saw was that our, we spend over $900,000 a year on cell phones. Um, a lot of people now have their own phones. They bring them anyway. So, so what if we did BYOD? So it sounds great at first till we talk about things like a stipend. Um, you know, we only pay $59 a month for each BlackBerry, or that's what we had been doing uh, at the time we were talking about this. Uh, if we do a $50 stipend, uh, factor in early termination fees, uh, all that stuff, it's, it's almost a wash, and we're not really saving any money. So um, some of that stuff didn't sound great at first, but long term it, it might be. So we're still kicking, kicking those ideas around. Uh, there's no, we came up with three options recently. It's, uh, it's just force everybody to bring their own phone. Anybody that needs a phone just has to bring one. Other hospitals are doing that. Um, that's going to be a, a tough one to, to chew, though, for some people that have had free phones for years and years. So uh, we talked about doing a BYOD transition, basically letting them keep their phone they have now uh, and uh, give them a $50 stipend. Um, or we just continue on and do our pre-approved device list and keep giving out phones. So that's still on the table. Um, but with Link, the understanding with a lot of management is that we can you know, mask your cell phone number. So because a lot of people didn't want to give up their cell phone number and have that published in our corporate directory, well, the way around that is to use um, Link Enterprise Voice. And um, easy enough, give, a, give everybody their desk phone number on their, on their uh, Link mobile client, do things like Simul Ring. But um, it, it, that works great if, you're, if you have a desk phone, which a lot of these people don't. So, um, get into that in a minute about uh, some of the challenges we ran into, but we can save money this way. So that's something where that's that's actually the biggest push going on for for us to do more with Enterprise Voice. Um, Link Online Meeting was a big hit for IT and uh, our PMO. Um, actually, our PMO in, uh, is part of IT, but our admin assistants in other areas have helped pave the way for other um, other areas ran into a few issues with that that I'll also get into and challenges here in a minute. Uh, just some lessons learned, but overall working great. Uh, everybody loves not having to call telecom when they need a conference bridge, especially when it's an emergency. Um, I don't know, saving ten, fifteen thousand dollars a year. Not not a huge savings just yet, but it will be soft, once we I mean, roll this out. Very, definitely soft costs associated with I mean, it. Because uh, then you're not taking up uh, telecom's time in order to provision and be provision, you know, reprovision that conference bridge. So. Right. Not to mention the fact that you're, the call that that person chose. Right. You're taking up multiple people's time to set up that bridge. So. Right. Very good point. Um, so this is one of the neat things we're doing. I'll, I'll show you an actual workflow here in a second uh, graphically. Uh, iPod touches are, um, that's a way to give people cell phones without giving them cell phones with recurring charges. Uh, people like our facility staff, and even nursing now we're looking at, they don't need cell phones. They don't need, um, we've got a very good Wi-Fi network. We've got about 1,000 access points, uh, big Cisco wireless network. We're starting to do 802.11ac. Um, we've got very good coverage because we had Vocera uh, for, for a lot of our voice communications. So um, we've had a number of surveys done. We've beefed up our network. So, We've got a good Wi-Fi. We've got good Wi-Fi coverage, so that's a way to get around a. Um, that's a way to get around cell phones. So it's a device, uh, but it's a two-year two-year refresh rate, right? Yeah. So, so a couple of, couple of notes on if you want to deploy iPods to your you know environment. Uh, iPods are going to be on a two-year refresh, uh, and the reason for that is because uh, of the battery. The battery is not field replaceable, so. Uh, at the end of two years, it's prob probably not going to maintain a, a very good charge. Not to mention the fact that uh, you know Apple doesn't like to release updates for you know old equipment. Yep. Uh, so if there's yeah, yeah. we're we're actually going to do. Yeah, we're going to do replaceable batteries. We're going to do some kind of sleeve. If it. it not just yet, if we do nursing, that's kind of a, a something being proposed. If we do thousands of nursing devices, then we would probably do something like a replaceable replaceable battery and a barcode scanner and a sleeve. Either that or a purpose-built device, you know, um, you know, something a little bit more enterprise. Uh, I mean, 
also, the iFlash patches are really are really used in a uh, single device, single user uh, deployment scenario. So like, I am assigned this iPod touch. I don't pass it off to somebody else. Uh, we don't recommend that if you want to implement a shared device model to use an iPod touch. Um, use something a little bit more enterprise ready for that. Okay, and the reason for that is because uh, and we found this with like numerous projects. Uh, we actually had a Vocera implementation, we still do. Uh, we went from a shared Vocera platform to you know, method to you know, individually assigned. And the number of breaks associated with you know, those devices dropped dramatically yep. when we went through that, uh, to that scenario. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit more, you know, it's a little bit more upfront cost to do that, but I mean, it makes up for it with the, le with the you know, the less breakage you'll have. Yep. Um, again, if you do a shared device model, definitely go for a more rugged, more purpose-built device. Yep. Okay. It's important right here, fifth generation, front-facing mic. So you can actually use it like a phone. That's, so that's something new that kind of enabled that to really be more useful. We're, we're uh, talking about it. We, we just had a, a survey, a study done on our nursing communications. We actually brought in a consulting firm to, to help with that. Um, nursing's a, a tough nut to crack. Um, everybody's kind of afraid of changing what they do and then having a revolt. So a uh, consultant was brought in to basically work between us to make recommendations. Uh, we just found out, I think, what, Friday? The recommendation was you guys should use something text-based. Right, which Vocera is. Which Vocera is not, and that's all it really told us. So the one thing, it, di it didn't really tell us what we should do, except it told us we shouldn't use Vocera. So we are probably moving away from that. Well, and, and the thing is that if you consider all the other applications that you can install on a, on a smart device rather than a Vocera badge, because a Vocera badge is very singularly purpose, right? Yeah. I can only communicate Excellent, with Vocera, excellent point. Right? Well, with a smart device, I can install, oh, I can install all these different medical apps that I could potentially use in my job. Which they're going to have to use. Epic's even got, Epic's got a few that we're going to start rolling out. Uh, we're going to upgrade to, um, Epic's our electronic medical record, and uh, we're moving to, um, we're upgrading to Epic 2014 later this year, and that adds a lot of mobile capabilities. And, and the, other, the other aspect of it was the cost. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with what the cost per badge is. Yeah, it's like six hundred dollars a badge. Yep. Uh, no. With with what? I'm sorry. With uh. With uh with the iPod. The latest OS. We haven't really we haven't tested that. But as of as of I mean, last time we tested it out, it hasn't become an issue. Well, here, here's, uh, here's kind of our, what we've done with our pilot program. Our, uh, there was a new ticketing system rolled out to facilities, and facilities is 900 people. So it's, it's a kind of a broad term for a number of different groups that do things like HVAC, um, environmental services. We've got a number of things that, you know, we think healthcare, we always think doctors and nurses. But, you know, a good chunk of the organization is stuff like this. So this is, this is equally as important for us. Um, so well, I'm going to show you a sample workflow of how something would work. Uh, say a, a TGH employee sees that a, something like a light's out. Um, you know, that's, that's a common thing. They typically call a number and report it. Um, so now they, re now they report it. It goes into what's called a, B it's a BMC product now called Footprints. It's our uh, ticketing system. So traditionally that had gone... Somebody had called a number, then it went to a page, they called back, um, then they went and dealt with a ticket, printed out a piece of paper, got the piece of paper, went and dealt with a fixing the light bulb. Now it goes through footprints, um, emails them, uh, and goes to their iPod Touch. So now they can get email and respond through email or however they need to on their device, not a pager anymore. Uh, but the neat the neat thing is they can go and check their ticket. Um, that's something they couldn't do on a pager. 
There was, there was just too much text in the ticket to even get a ticket anymore, so we had to do something. Um, but also with Link Enterprise Voice now, we give them a phone. So this is, they, they love it. They have one device now they can do everything on, costs $200, uh, maybe a little more with a case, but very easy to support. Um, we, are, we, we do have some challenges with Enterprise Voice that I'll, uh, I'll get into in a minute when we, when we start wrapping up. But uh, here's a, the typical workflow, though, is that they can use Enterprise Voice now. They have a phone, and they can call back. They can call their fellow facilities people and say, hey, I just got here. I uh, got the wrong light bulb. Bring me a light bulb. Or, hey, I noticed this other thing's wrong. Um, so I've got this camera icon here you'll notice on each of these facilities. Things. Um, this other piece, Link Mobile. So they have Link now. So they can do IM. They have their choice of how they want to communicate with each other. But this is kind of a neat thing. They have, um, these are camera phones, basically. The iPods have, um, and it, it was a lesson learned for us, the fifth generation iPods don't all have rear-facing cameras. So we had ordered a batch of them and then found out, oh no, they can't use them because they need a rear-facing camera so they could take pictures of barcodes and uh, equipment tags and equipment and things like that. Uh, what is it, the 16 gig and up ones, yeah. I think? So just something to note, not all iPods have rear-facing cameras. So, so they, they specifically needed those, but now they can send, they can send pictures back and forth and that really speeds up their workflow fixing equipment. So this thing's been great all around. Uh, they're kind of our pilot groups, and now we're looking at doing it for things like nursing. So here, here's some of the things that I, that I mentioned now. Again, we're, we're early on. We're still in pilot phases of all this stuff. But um, some of the things we ran into are, some of them are kind of comical, but some of them were, were hey, my meeting started, I set up a meeting for my boss, and we can't start the conference bridge because uh, they have to put in a pin. We do one-time uh, one time use conference bridge, conference bridge IDs. Um, so a lot of people set up meetings for other people. So that's something we had to, we had to deal with. But we can always ha tell them to start a start a meeting using their link client and that'll open up the bridge. Yeah, our, our users are, are we're familiar with the concept of, you know, they were assigned a conference and then just the conference bridge number and yep. then that's all they would have to do no yep. matter if they were the participant or the leader. Uh, so in link that there's a different there's a different method for doing that, right? You yep. have to your leader has to start the meeting before yep. the meeting proceeds. So that was waiting a waiting in the lobby. Waiting in the lobby, yeah. <laughs> so uh, so that was a big, uh, that was a big change for our users. Yep. So uh, something that, and th that was like, and we didn't realize that until after we deployed it, and uh, you know, we started getting those calls in later. Um, this docked laptops, and I got, I got to speed up, so we're, we're gonna run a little on time. But uh, docked laptops is just uh, another lesson learned. Where our PMO is our pilot group, and we were waiting for them to. They said their video wasn't working. Uh, you know, we, we went over to see why their video wasn't working. Well, they have laptops with webcams, but guess what? They dock them when they sit at their desk, so their webcam's not open. Um, and they would do things like join the link meeting, but also dial in on their phone, and now they've got a feedback loop going on. So there, you know, there are things like that that we've, that we've run into, but that's all, that's all education. Um, DID limitation is, is our real sticking point with rolling this out. It's, our biggest, we, it's actually our biggest issue. We've yeah. got, um, yeah. we, we have uh, 844, which I found out recently. I didn't know this at first. I feel dumb now, but it spells TGH. And we were lucky enough to get that exchange years and years ago. Um, our former CEO said, I don't want anybody to ever have to dial an extension. I want a human to answer every time somebody calls the hospital. So that meant everybody gets a DID automatically. Well, we're out. So things like facilities where they don't have a desk phone. Now we're giving them a phone number. What do you do? You give them something like a five-digit extension, which we've been doing. They can call each other internally. They can call outbound, but we can't route inbound. So we need to, we need to figure some of that out. We talked about bringing in another exchange just for the link side, but that's, some of that's to be determined. But that's, you know, that's, that's a very real thing we need to, we need to figure out. Um, shared numbers are, are of course, we, we've got a lot of delegates and um, people with front offices, so we've got, you know, we've got some challenges around that. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, I just mentioned the two P PBX thing. That's, that's a struggle for us right now because we've got, we're starting to do more with I link. actually, I actually want to bring something about the doctors and the shared numbers. So in our directory, we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of these shared numbers. Not, not a lot, it's, but it's a, pretty numerous. But uh, what ends up happening is that, you know, you search for, like let's say you, you got a call from somebody and you wanted to do a search, right? Well, that number is listed on multiple records yep. in AD. So, so like Link doesn't know which one you want to bring up. So it brings up pretty much the first one that it comes up with. So, and that, that creates problems, that creates yep. tickets for us. You know, it's like, oh, well, the reason why that's happening is because this, this number is associated with numerous people. So that, and that's something that we're trying to uh, overcome by, you know, getting the, uh, getting the doctor to provide a unique number for that. Um, you know, we've got a, we, we, as I said, we licensed all our users for Link Enterprise Voice, so, you know, our, our C-levels hear that, hey, we already paid for this, use it, but they don't know things like, all right, we've got two, uh, two PBXs now, so we need to do things like buy and buy a license, to, uh, PCA license to split the call when it comes in. So there's, you know, that's not a big cost, but it's still a cost. So it's not free because we bought the Microsoft license. So uh, we're trying to educate about that. But you know, bringing, if we do bring telecom under UC, it's gonna help with a lot of these discussions. But we, we know we are gonna be out of support with our, uh, our Avaya PBX at some point. So we're we're, we've started the conversations. What do we wanna do? Do we wanna bring in, um, do we wanna make Link the, uh, the PBX? Is that our replacement? Do we do Cisco? Do we go with the new version of Avaya? You know, this right here. This is our, you know, this is this is what we have to fight. Though, our uh, our director brings that up all the time. So he says, 13 minutes of downtime in 20 years." So that's you know that's a tough one to challenge. But you know, it's a hospital. We have to keep things going. Um, I do want to. I do want to. I do want to do a uh, special plug for uh, one of our vendors we've done, that's helped us on this side, uh, Arrow S3. They're actually uh, here in the room. Um, they are a VIA vendor that have uh, helped bridge the gap between the IP and the voice side. So uh, we're very thankful to them because new guys like me on the voice side um, are having to get up to speed. And we've got the guys that have been doing telecom for a real long time might not be doing it much longer, so we've got a lot to do real quickly. Um, so I think a lot of people are in the same boat, but um, but people like them have, have really helped us out. Yep. Is Yeah, I don't, you know, I'm not, do you know, Chris? I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, there's still quite a bit of PDM. I don't know what version it is. Um, uh, I mean, the majority, the most of what I know about the uh, Avaya PDX is that it's a TX-1000. Uh, oh, old Nor Nortel. Nortel, yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay. So, there's, there's been, there's been some. Uh, yeah. yeah, that means it went into the Meridian. Yeah. Yep. So there's been some uh, upgrades to the CS1000, CS obviously, since it right. initially went in. Uh, there's a lot of Avaya components that are, you know, put hanging into off hanging yep. off of it, essentially. And that's actually what we're doing to do the uh, link integration. We're actually doing an Avaya or a session manager to yep. provide that uh, that SIP gateway functionality to yep. Link. Right. Yep. That was uh, one of the. One of the few and only approved methods that you could do uh, link via uh, integration. Yep. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah it is. <laughs> um, I'm going to speed through some of these because we're we're a little over, but um, but um, it's good you guys have asked questions in the middle anyway. So, and again, we're we're going to be available after this. But this, real quick, this is our this is a lot of the stuff that um, Chris has done behind the scenes using PowerShell and. Some other things. Uh, the uh, the the purple is our phone number flow, and that shows how how things get provisioned 
and updated in the provision. So blue, um, blue is user account information, purple is phone numbers. So, uh, you know, again, when somebody comes on, com somebody comes on board or leaves, a lot of this stuff happens automatically. It's constantly changing, um, but couldn't do it, it, we couldn't support it without automation. But uh, some of the open, the open architecture of these systems has really allowed that, so that's why I wanted to point out on the left some of the, some of the things we're doing on the Microsoft side, but also some of the uh, third-party integration. And uh, as far as federation, we are open federated, and one of the neat use cases we have is uh, within Florida, we are, we are one of three poison control centers. So we support the, uh, we support the Tampa section in the, in the middle, uh, but we need to do, we need to fail over uh, sometimes with the other, the others for overflow or for downtime and communicate in real time with the other um, poison control centers in Miami and uh, Jacksonville. So this allows us to do that. They love link. So, um, so that's kind of a neat use case we have for it. Uh, we've also started to do some federation with some other people. So I mentioned, you know, USF Health, we're, our, we're the primary teaching hospital for USF. Uh, Moffitt's a, uh, you know, a big organization. They're, they're local to us. Um, and then Microsoft CDW, some of our vendors. So it's good to get order updates, things like that, instant support. Um, and then, like, we're starting to do more with Florida Hospital. So we know they're, we know they're here. They're a link user. So, um, so we can start to do more with them. Are you guys all familiar with the concept of open federation? Oh, okay. So there was some uh, hesitation as to whether or not we should enable that because we were worried that we would get spammed all the time from outside. Yep. Uh, luckily to say that that has not happened. Nope, so it's been. It's actually been. Been uh, great. It's actually been. So, quiet, so now that we say that. What's that? Uh, I can't let them know. <laughs> yes. No. Yeah. They are. Um, and, and, and as we say that, I'm also, though, saying anybody here, meaning at this conference, that would like to connect with us. So just right. so you guys know, we are open federated. Right. So our, our SIP address is so don't, our email don't spam. addresses. So if, uh, <laughs> if you ever type us up in the link, we'll, we'll send it. So some, some of the next things, we already mentioned some of the stuff we have to do, fin finish getting our reverse proxy uh, set up for the Link 2013 implementation actually roll out 2013 desktop client. We're in the middle of a Windows XP to Windows 7 deployment right now. Uh, almost done, but uh, up against the deadline. But um, once we finish that, then we'll roll this out. We don't want to complicate the imaging right now. Um, officially roll out Link 2013 mobile, and then set up um, System Center Operations Manager monitoring for, um, for Link. Um, we're doing some of our own monitoring, but we, we're doing a uh, SCOM implementation, so we'll do, we'll do a little bigger uh, monitoring rollout. Um, we initially started out with doing just synthetic transactions to monitor link functionality, and then once we got SCOM integrated, we, yep. uh, we went to that. Uh, the uh, Tanberg, as I mentioned, we kind of held off on that, but we're going to look at that again, um, and I, I'm going to do another, another plug for the one other vendor that we, we do a lot of work with. That was uh, AVISPL. There are... Um, they're our audio video vendor, and they've been great. They support our, our conference rooms. Uh, Tambergs have been, have been awesome, but we need to figure out a way to get them back into the mix now. They're the ones that originally got it working for us with uh, Link to Tanberg. So that was, that was really cool, but again, we didn't roll it out because we, we didn't roll it out to the end users because we knew we were going to have to redo it. So um, we're going to look at some new possibilities, maybe, maybe look at some of the Link room systems like Polycom and Smart and some of the other ones now. So, so we saw a Polycom demonstration uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, you know it, it looks great. So, um, so you know that's another option. I don't, I don't know yet. We've got a big uh, Cisco investment to protect too. So, we're looking at ways to ease that in. Um, persistent chat haven't gone down that road yet, but something we want to start playing with. Um, Skype integration. That's one we've been really waiting on video for. We got it set up, or I say we, Chris got it set up um, very quickly actually, so works great, but audio only. Once we get video, uh, we'll do some uh, patient to doctor communication. We've actually, our, one of the things we've been asked about was uh, pastoral care, and that's something. They've been, they've been asking us for a while. Like, yeah, we that's. We want the functionality, we want it now. 
yeah, they got to be able to communicate with uh, patients in different areas, sometimes in isolation and places like that where they can't actually go in the room. So they want to be able to video conference with these patients. So great, great use case, but they want to do it with FaceTime. And we said, that's not, that's not our standard. That's going to be hard to support. So we said, let's do it with Skype. And then we said, oh, great, we can't do it with, we can't do video yet to link. So as soon as that's there, they're going to be one of our, one of the first to get it. Um, and then some of the, uh, as I mentioned, like the doctors and the nurses especially use auto login machines, so they don't have access to a link client as easily. I think that's going to be easier with our uh, mobile deployments and, and possibly if we do something like, like BDI. Um, nurses also need to be able to communicate with doctors in real time when they're in rooms with patients and can't go in there. So that's something we need to tackle. But again, our, our um, physicians are typically not employed by us, so they are not licensed for links. So maybe we just license them and set them up. We need to, we need to figure that out. We haven't done that yet. So again, we've got a lot to, a lot to still do, but um, I think we're going in the right path. And then we're going to integrate some of these systems. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you in a minute how this can all come together, and we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, so I mentioned we might, we might do a separate telephone exchange because we're out of DIDs, so maybe we can start doing that and we'll bridge the gap there or at least allow us to test with another exchange and use Link as a true PBX by itself. Um, and then, so I, I just want ahead. to step on that real quick. The, uh, the current, our current integration right now with our PBX is that uh, you know, for the initial pilot, we, wanted, we didn't want to break your existing uh, phone system. So what we did was that we integrated the PBX system uh, with Link so that regardless if somebody's trying to call you, your Avaya desk phone will ring as well as your Link phone will ring. And then whichever, whichever phone you pick up yep. maintains control of that call yep. um, with the same number, right? It's seamless to the yeah. user. Now, that's great. It works. Um, it works great. The problem is the scalability. Yep. Um, Doing it on a large scale is problematic because it involves two separate teams um, in order to do that. Uh, not to mention the fact we are running out of DID, so at some point we won't even be able to do yep. that anymore. Um, so uh, that's why we are trying. We need to re rethink the way we're doing that yep. and go with a you know truly dedicated you know link as a separate PBX that functions yep. on its own. Thank you. Um, and this is kind of how it's all going to tie together. This is a, uh, this is kind of a pie in the sky. Um, all the things we need to do, we've got all these ways that we need to get in touch with doctors. Like I said, ultimately we need to get the patient in touch with the right doctor at the right time with the right information. How do we do that? We can do things like Get Well Network where the patient has an interactive TV where they can request things. They can get their meds on, they can see what their medications are on TV. Um, they can order things. They can order their meds before they leave. They can uh, get educated about their conditions and uh, procedures. Uh, Skype integration, they can get hold of them eventually. My chart is a, is a piece of epic. It's their, their own health record they can get access to on the web. Um, we've got system, what I call system-generated um, events and, and types of requests that can come out of our, our EMR and SunQuest is our lab system, McKesson is our, uh, our PAC system, our uh, radiology system. Um, and then we've got clinicians, which is anybody. It could be uh, any, any clinical person, like a doc, it could be a doctor, a nurse, a lab tech, a radiology tech. Uh, so I call them clinicians, but they're gonna use Link and AMCOM primarily to communicate. So how do we know what doctor or what other clinician to get hold of we're hoping eventually we can tie presence through all these things together. So using real-time location system through RFID tags and um, triangulation with Wi-Fi, things like that, we can know who is closest to a room. Um, things like alarms. Do we, you know, if a nurse is in a room, don't send an audible alarm to them because they're already in the room by the equipment. Um, AMCOM has some of its own presence capabilities based on physician preferences. We can leverage Link's presence uh, to tie in with AMCOM. Eventually, that's what we've been promised. So eventually, all these things we're hoping to t help tie together getting the communications to the right person at the right time. And then with the mobility, um, one mobile device 
That's all the physician has to carry. No more than 1990s pagers. Just one smartphone that's their choice of smartphone. They can get the right information at the right time, take care of the patient, and drive up patient satisfaction scores. We get our money, invest in more technology, and uh, hopefully everybody's happy. And that's, that's you know, what we're trying to build with all this. So, so that's, uh, that's the end of our presentation. So I know we went to... Uh, an hour and 15, but we're going to be here. So if you guys, so we're, uh, we're done with the presentation, but you guys have uh, questions. Go ahead. We're treating it as a transient message. Uh, so basically as a phone call. Uh, so in essence, we're not, we're not archiving it. You, you're probably the, the fifth person in, uh, in the last day that's asked us that. Yeah, I exactly. We, we, you know, that's going back to what HIPAA states, and that's, you know, it's what you have written in your policy. And we wrote into policy that things like phone calls, instant messaging are considered transient messages. We do not save them. They're not stored there's on the not, device. There's not a whole lot of uh, guidance on uh, how long you should store something. But there is a lot of guidance that says that if you do send something, that it must be encrypted. Which, uh, which it is. So um, as far as the storage is goes, it's, it's basically whatever your policy states it is. So uh, we didn't want to get in the business of archiving messages, so we put in our policy that we are not archiving your messages. Oh, oh I got one. Do you own the contact center, and if so, how does that serve as images? The contact center, so like what are we using for we do, uh, but not for the link, though. Uh, AMCOM is actually uh, our contact center um, that we utilize. Um, AMCOM is, is, a, is our contact center. Is it a third party? It's a third party, oh. yeah. AMCOM is actually a subsidiary of USA Mobility, who makes most of our pagers. So, they're, so it's kind of funny that they've gotten into this business. So. They're somewhat competing with Link, but we do other we do other things like with it. Like we've had it for eight years, but it's been our position on call schedule. It's been a web app that's our so, on call schedule, but now it's our, also our call center app. So I just want to say, like Amcom is not a uh, they don't they don't integrate into Link uh, very well. Uh, we're trying to get them to integrate presence capabilities right now um, because that would be very helpful. But uh, the contact center is not like a contact center that's built. Uh, we do that. We have those two. <laughs> we have those two. We have a, we have quite a bit of mix. So we don't. Uh, our primary contact center for uh, dialing into the main number is the uh, is the AMCOM system. For other systems like uh, help desk, uh, we have a help desk. So um, and uh, what we call the SRC. The SRC handles things like um, service response center. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, it handles things like oh my light bulb's out and whatever. So the they each have their own call centers. Uh, they use, yeah, they have those off of Avaya. Right now, eventually we'll do things like skill sets and route it appropriately. Yeah, response. Uh, question in the back. So when you're doing the generation of all the other partners, is there concern about them sending PCs out over and Yeah, you know, that's, we view that right now as, as some of that's policy on the, yeah, kind of like don't, don't take a picture of patient information with your smart, your smartphone and post it on Facebook. So you know, it's, we've got, we've got that, those sort of controls in place. So it's another system. We, we give them tools to do certain things. And if they do that, there, there, there are HR administrative policies that, those are being controlled that way. With things like email, we do we enforce TLS encryption or we block outbound EPHI. We we, we do DLP. Yeah, we do a lot of that in other systems, but this one's this one's been a tougher one to do. That's a that's a great question. So also we have we have uh, access to federation um, is blocked for the majority of users. Uh, so we don't allow for the majority of nursing. They do not have access to federation. Correct, yes. Yep. So, 
So like the majority of people that have federation capabilities are going to be your office workers, um, which are not in the clinical, they're not in the clinical uh, workflow. So. I can't remember the company's name. What was that company's name? Well, I've looked at Aeroscout, um, and uh, there's one company that actually does both. Yeah, uh, and that was the one that we were looking at because out. we wanted to provide. Uh, they wanted to provide. Uh, Eka to, Eka House, one of the. Uh, they wanted to get we general. They wanted to be able to do general location, but they also wanted to be very, very specific. So there's this one system that does uh, triangulation, but then it also combines that with tagging. So you can get extremely detailed you know, results. It, to where that, that's not been all planned out. We are wiring. Hey, uh, okay. I've got a Skype card oh, for you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're done. If you guys want to stick around, though, uh, you're welcome to for a little bit longer. Um, we, uh, we wired for this GetWell Networks project. That's where a lot of this, uh, that's where the RTLS is going to come from eventually. Right now, we're just trying to get all the patient rooms wired. We've got a project going on. We're running 6,000 cables to patient rooms right now, um, about 900 rooms. And uh, some of those cables are not being assigned for anything yet, but they're being put there in case we do things like uh, uh, RFID tagging. And uh, you know, we're kind of building for the future. It's really hard to get into patient rooms. Some of them you can go months without being able to get into. And we've got a, a infection control procedures. Uh, we have to file of this uh, form called an ICRA, it's an uh, infection control uh, authorization form. And that's got to get approved, then you have to time it with getting patients out of the rooms, you have to put up negative uh, pressure systems. It's, it's very tough to do, so we're going to do a one, you know, one pass through each area, get everything wired, and then, so some of that's not um, officially ironed out yet, but that's, we know we're going to be doing this stuff in the future. I don't know how soon, but again, some of that's pie in the sky. Hopefully, we can tie all these things together. Uh, some of them, it's not quite there, but it's on the roadmap. So. We definitely do want to do, I mean, the um, uh, RTLS is very, we re really want to do that uh, because we have, we run into that issue, I'm assuming you guys are probably familiar with, you, you, you're trying to locate a pump and it could be in some, some closet somewhere because apparently nurses are hoarders, um, so. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, you'll come across a closet one day, and then <laughs> all, your, all your pumps are right there. So yeah, we, we d that would be that would be a part of the implementation. Yeah, is for infant abduction. Um, like I said, it's we haven't done anything yet with that, but it's, it is something we're definitely pursuing. Hey, you guys want to come up and get some cards? But uh, we need to wrap up in the room. But uh, thank you, everybody.